Today, I would like to welcome Constantine Anthony, current mayor of Burbank, California, to our Deep Power podcast. Mayor Anthony studied film at San Francisco State University. He moved to Burbank following graduation to become an actor, where he spent the next 20 years doing improv comedy and film. He decided to enter the political arena with a passion for social justice. He ran for city council in 2020 and won the race with a record-breaking vote count. He became the first openly autistic elected official west of the Mississippi River. Mayor Anthony, welcome to today's Deep Power podcast. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me on. It's a pleasure to have you here, and it's it's exciting to be able to talk to elected officials who run different parts of our country. And uh, the city of Burbank is one that I uh, have spent time in when I lived in Santa Barbara and traveled back and forth. So it's fun to be able to talk with you and kind of help our viewers learn a little bit more about how uh, elected officials work and how cities might be run. Um, so thank you for, for, for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it, this is a huge, important topic, um, not just for my city, but uh, for around the country. Um, but before we get started, just for people paying attention, Burbank has about uh, 105,000 residents. Um, 17 square miles and about 80 percent of our power generation is from a natural gas burning plant uh the magnolia power plant we call it and um we purchase the rest of our power from uh other local municipalities uh la city is the biggest one um but it's so heartbreaking to me uh when people come to my office and say what are you doing to get us off fossil fuels and the way our city is constructed you know we're landlocked we're surrounded by multiple other municipalities it's hard for us to change where our power comes from we can't build giant solar fields in 17 square miles of you know a uh, dense uh, uh, urban uh uh, construction um, and there's nowhere to put uh, windmills or anything like that. So, so issues like this, um, things that are you know uh, basically technological disruptors in the industry, uh, give great opportunity and and uh, greater discussion for how we can move forward. I love that and thank you. And I'm gonna be interested to dive a little bit more into. Uh, the different sources of power the city city gets. And and I know on your website, you have uh, several areas that talk about sustainability and clean energy. Before we get there, I just love for our audience to learn, you know, how did you get interested in public service and how did that interest really lead you to run for Burbank City Council and then ultimately becoming mayor? Uh, so, yeah, I was an actor um, for a long time. I did uh, comedy and film and television and um, that's what brought me to Burbank. Burbank is um, the, we're called the media capital of the world. We have a number of film and television uh, production studios and animation and post-production. Um, we're a big, big media town. Um, but uh, in 2016, um, after the presidential election, I became very worried about the direction our country was going and I and a number of other people um, that I have met along the way changed their, you know, course in life and gave up one career for another. Um, I put the um, entertainment professional uh, career down and I decided to join the political sphere. Um, it was... It was an interesting transition because I entered a space where people, I often come across people who want to be politicians, right? Um, you find that a lot in politics where people are like, I want to run for office and I want to be in charge and I want to be a politician. And it's odd to me because I don't want to do that. I, I ran for office because I was worried that something was going to happen and I just wanted to help people. Um, and so every time I like try to ask people to like vote for me or to donate to me, 
it always feels weird because I'm like, well, I mean, if there was anybody else, you know, I'd get them going and get them elected. Uh, but as it is, I'm the only one here. So can I please <laughs> help you? <laughs> Uh, and, and most people find that uh, kind of refreshing, I guess, a politician who doesn't want to be a politician. Um, I've sort of fell into it and forced into it. And um, and right now, it's funny, uh, I'm in the middle of another campaign. I'm trying to become an L.A. County supervisor. So it's a higher office and it's sort of the same impetus for me to run the um the person who's in my seat right now is uh, friendly with fossil fuels and is a um you know very backwards thinking kind of politician and in fact um a couple of friends of mine have tried to run against this incumbent multiple times and i supported them and i did the thing where i raised money for them and i got them to go out and vote and they couldn't do it and now both of them are like, you should do it. I'm like, okay. So it's, again, I'm in the same position of, well, I really don't want to be doing this, um, but I'm the only one around. Um, so I feel like, I don't know, it's it's an odd, it's an odd job. Um, the seat I'm running for has a huge amount of desert and mountain. And I made a commitment to build thousand megawatts of solar and wind in a place called the Antelope Valley. There have been permits uh, filed to do exactly that for decades, to build huge renewable energy. And the um, the person I'm running against has blocked those permits for decades. And so it's, it's, um, it's one of those things where if I don't get this seat, we will continue down this fossil fuel path that has been destructive to our entire ecosystem. Um, and so I'm excited to talk to you about uh, geothermal power because yeah. this is, you know, I've had discussions about hydroelectric, nuclear, and now we're here. So yeah, wonderful. Me. Well, thanks for that background. I think it's, um, you know, obviously people have gotten wealthy somehow being in politics, but most people in politics will tell you, you, you know, take a step back usually and you're not making money and it's hard. And it's, you know, sometimes you, you have to supplement that job with other income somehow, you know, I know you still drive, uh, for some of the rideshare companies or you did, yeah. which Andrew, is, I made, I made $22,000 last year. Right, so. right. No, I know. So you're not honestly doing this to get rich. Uh, I do like how, you know, meeting your constituents while you're driving. I think that's a really interesting angle. But, um, you know, I think fossil fuels is a very polarizing conversation, right? We have right, left. We have conversations that really divide people. For me, you know, whenever we are dependent on foreign governments, corporations, regimes, tyrants to to supply our power, that's a very risky position it puts us in. And I'm I'm an American through you know through and through i love our country but you know for how modern we are how advanced our technology is to say that we can be dependent on countries across the, across the globe or even conflict across the world can cause such fluctuation in our core you know commodity of 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 fuel gas is very risky and scary to me and so one of the reasons i jumped into uh, this industry was to try to find a way to create true energy independence that was one of the only, you know, true base load renewable energy. And when I say base load, solar and wind are awesome supplemental energy sources, but they're not base load. They cannot provide the always on 24 seven. So really nuclear is one of the only other clean um, renewable sources and then you have something like, uh, you know, hydro, which can be, but that's very geographically limiting and then geothermal. So um, as we talk today, you know, maybe I'd love to share a little bit about that. But I think one of the things that's also polarizing is the mandate California came out to, you know, be carbon neutral by 2045. And that's a very strong goal. It's caused ripples throughout the, the country. Um I know California is trying to be out in front and, and the city of Burbank has a section on your website talking about sustainability. So I, I have two questions. One, do you feel it's possible for a state with over 39 million people 
to really hit carbon neutrality? And second, how much power influence do, does someone like a city have in helping meet that net zero carbon goal for like the state, right? So one, is it possible? And two, in your role, can you influence that? Uh, I'll take your questions in reverse order. I great. think that the city is actually making great progress. So Burbank uh, has uh, passed a number of um, ordinances and deadlines and 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 like plans and dates to get to those levels um, uh, in a in a in a very efficient way, and we are actively seeking the um, purchase of this power from outside of the state right now, um, which is, you know, a little bit better than purchasing our natural gas from, you know, places like Ukraine and Russia, which are just using it all up right now in their uh, futile war. Um, when I look at those uh, uh, goalposts that we've set for ourselves, I realize that if we are the only ones doing it, we might be able to reach there successfully. But with this state mandate, you're now seeing a huge number of other local municipalities compete for those same mm -hmm. green resources. So although I applaud uh, the governor and the state legislator for setting these goals, um, they've basically forced a shot clock on us um, and made us compete with each other um mandating that municipalities have to move towards green energy without providing that green energy uh, it seems um a little backwards so to answer your first question i think we can get there um a lot of people don't realize that most of california is um um, affected by uh, a huge amount of plate tectonics and, and rivers and valleys and mountainous ranges. Uh, this is why we're famous for earthquakes. So we have a bunch of space, just areas in this state that have the ability, uh, uh, huge flatlands for solar and a lot of mountainous regions with windy areas for uh, wind power generation. So we can match a lot of what is being asked of us simply through solar and wind. Um, but like you said, that is still not guaranteed. Uh, you know, if it's not windy that day or if it's cloudy that day, there goes your uh, base load generation. So looking at alternatives to this, um, and I think uh, geothermal is a huge component of that. Where do we build it? How do we build it? Can we streamline the permits? Can we make sure that we are protecting the environment when we do it? Um, putting in the regulations to make sure that it's safe um, and uh, the companies that are coming in to do the work uh, do so in a um, uh, non-toxic and um, good paying uh, union job fashion. Like all of these things need to get, um, you know, stratified into the, uh, development process, but we can get there. Uh, so I, I'm, you know, excited about it. It's one of the reasons why I'm running because I know I can do all of that stuff because we've done it in Burbank. And for me to jump ahead and 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 uh, try to get these kinds of policies in place is not just going to help my city. I love my city, but we have a lot of neighboring cities. Yeah that I'm trying to help out as well, a lot of these little municipalities that have passed their own uh, green initiatives. So right next door, uh, another well-known city, Glendale, California, uh, almost twice the size of Burbank, um, has a huge green energy component to their plans, and I want to be able to help them out. So, you know, by pushing for the state and for the county and at some point getting the federal government dollars to support all that, um, we're not just helping, you know, our, our local area, we're creating a a, um, a game plan, yeah. a blueprint really for not just California, but the rest of the country and hopefully the world. Right. I mean, and you make some very, very important points that I think have fueled some of the controversy. I understand 
a mandate and you got to start somewhere and it's got to push. And without some maybe deadline, people will get too comfortable and maybe they'll not, not make change fast enough. Right. And sometimes right. those artificial goalposts, you know, fuel innovation. But you said something important that has caused kind of fear and panic that people understand that there's not the reliability of the alternative sources yet. You know, I have friends in California still that say, hey, we have a brownout. I can't even plug my electric vehicle in. You know, how are we supposed to be completely off the grid, you know, off fossil? And and that's some of the the fear. And, um, you know, what all are the alternatives? You know, a small city like Burbank can't afford to build their own necessarily, or maybe they can. There just isn't, you know, it's not known or the technology is not quite there. So I, I, I agree with you that, um, there needs to be the mandate to cause innovation and push towards a goal. But, you know, one of the things that is interesting is our nation's grid system on average is anywhere from 40 to 75 years old. It's okay. right. It's archaic and it's, you know, it's risky and there's, there's, it, it's, it's prone for attacks and disasters. And so people, people have that unease. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, Mayor Anthony, when I ask anyone on the street, I say, Hey, do you know where your power comes from? 99% of the people completely don't know. They don't care because they just want it to, when they flip their switch, they just want it to work, right? And part of that is educating, saying, hey, do you know your power, it comes from coal? And they're like, what? You know, or, and most people don't know and they don't, and I encourage them to research because it's just enlightening to just know where is your sources coming from, right? Um, oh, I say this all the time. Uh, you know, the city of Burbank is a very like progressive, liberal far left leaning political kind of, you know, crunchy granola city. Uh, you know, we, we vote in that political sphere. And yet when I turn to my average voter and say, do you know, when you turn on the lights, that's natural gas. And they go, what do you mean natural gas? You mean like clean gas? I'm like, no, that's not a thing. <laughs> we use fossil fuels to keep your power going. And they're they're bewildered, right? What? Why? What is happening? Yep. And I explained to them, it's like most of LA County, which is a very liberal blue district, runs off of fossil fuels. Yep. It, it's it's such a like you said archaic infrastructure. We really just haven't invested the time and energy and money into changing that and, right. and you know there's a big discussion happening right now about uh battery storage technology yep. um hydrogen like trying to incorporate those new technologies but those are still years away from being effective um just this year the city of burbank got a grant to uh install a um 70 kilowatt with a k 70 kilowatt uh iron flow battery um, as a sort of a pilot program to see how well it works, um, you know, what percentage of the storage remains and how efficient it is. Um, I'm hopeful that the battery storage technology can catch up. It'll offset a lot of the ups and downs from solar and wind. Um, but, you know, all of the research that I'm seeing and that uh, I'm hearing from is that, you know, uh, there's an opportunity or geothermal to come in, depending on where you put it, and to take a lot of that base load generation yeah. off of the backs of these smaller power plants. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, we just have to be able to say yes and do it right and get it out there. Yeah, and it starts with education. I mean, most people don't realize that when they say, oh, well, I have an electric car or you know, I'm being conscious because I have a solar panels on my roof that have, and I have a big lithium battery backup, you know, in my, in my garage. Most people don't realize that lithium is a rare earth mineral that's akin to a fossil fuel. It's not sustainable. It, it, it requires massive uh, carbon footprint to, to mine lithium. It, it oh, destroys the, the earth. Lithium, the extraction of lithium is so disastrous. Right. And, and then cobalt, right? You have to have cobalt to make lithium stable. And there's only two sources of cobalt commercially in the world. And one of them is where, you know, children are dying, mining it by hand. Right. And so education, people think, well, they turn a blind eye. Well, I'm being clean because I'm not using fossil fuel, but it's like, hold on. 
there's a whole story. We let's let's look at this in its entirety. But um, you know, one of the things also education, geothermal has amazing battery technology. And it sounds really weird, but if you could get heat from solar during the day, and then you can put that heat in the form of hot water or steam and put it back in the earth. You actually have the ability to tap that steam any t- any point in time and pull it back out in the form of a battery, right? Because if you can extract steam to turn a turbine during the day, then solar or wind, if it's if it's creating excess heat, which it does, and it needs to be stored, you can put that heat back in the earth in the form of heat, right? Steam or water, and then you can extract that back when you need it. And, and yeah. there's new technology of how the earth can be its own battery system storing heat. And people, I mean, it's making real cool progress, Mayor. That's the things oh, like yeah. that. And the key component there is if a municipality or, or a local government, if the core of their baseload generation is in a geothermal generator, what they've done is created that as the default. So by constructing those geothermal generators, all of the solar and wind becomes supplemental to that. Yes. So that you're not you're not building solar and wind to to have a steam generator. You're literally building a steam generator that has its own geothermal generation and then you build the solar and wind to supplement it. And right. so it, it works in tandem. It's it's yep. I'm appreciative of the new, uh, you know, iron flow battery technologies. And I think there's a, definitely an application for that, especially in remote areas and in, um, you know, uh, 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 junctions with that need uh, uh, generation out in, um, say, like a hillside or or uh, out on the, the highway that need to uh, send power over a river or a hillside or something like that. But your main power plant, right, your 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 core municipal power plant by creating that to be a steam generation uh, uh, storage and geothermal baseload generator that is how you sort of like get all of these little pieces yep, to work together. Uh, uh, connected yep. and, and it smooths it out one of yep. my big uh complaints about um rooftop solar i love that people are doing it it's not i'm not opposed to it the problem is first you get the individual person to pay for it, right? So the, the individual has to put up their own money. Two, you don't know who the independent contractor is that's coming in to do it. There's like a dozen different companies. So they could be building it in a dozen different ways. And three, because they're building it off the grid, there really isn't a known generation from the local uh, uh, power plant to know how much they're using or not using. Because... Mm-hmm. On a cloudy day, or if their battery is empty, that person is still tapped into the main grid. Right. So they are suddenly going to turn on their lights and start using power from the municipality generation. There's no way to predict. check that. Right. There's no way to know. Right. So, so I mean, I love that people want to build solar on their roofs. It is so sporadic and um, unregulated. It actually can create uh, deficiencies in local power generation. So if you do it yep. at the core, at the hub, and 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 the the local uh, water and power uh, has control and an understanding and knows all of the levels that they're generating, it actually makes it better for you. Prevent the brownouts, you prevent the blackouts. Yeah, yeah, and I think you you also touched on something that's. Um... That's interesting in terms of an, an established city like Burbank that has a, a a limitation of land availability. You've either built it all out or it's currently owned or there's not maybe much open space. How do you create your own energy without going outside the state, outside the, in the county? And one thing about geothermal, here's an interesting fact that you may or may not know, but you know the audience would be interested to hear. Two nine-inch holes, nine inches, drilled four to six miles deep can create as much power as 320 acres of solar panels so if you could potentially because what happens is you you spray water down one hole and then hot steam comes up another to turn a turbine theoretically you could have a 5,000 10,000 square foot building atop these two holes 
And that could be enough to power 50, 60,000 homes, right? So the, the land requirement for geothermal is so much smaller than wind or solar. The problem is, is digging deep enough to, to hit the temperature. And the magic number is 400 degrees Celsius. So there's pockets of, of temperature across the, the world that's shallow, right? And like hydro, people say, well, geothermal is only sustainable or only works if you're in those regions. And that's why people don't think it can be widely adopted. But if you can drill four to six miles deep anywhere on the planet, you can reach those temperatures. And that's when it becomes available to all. And not only that, a city such as Burbank could have its own power generation within its city because it has such a small footprint and, and and it could it could generate that, you know. So you'd have to have basically two of those plants to power 100,000 homes, almost your entire population, right? So it is theoretically very feasible, but one of the reasons that is it's caused delay is um, it requires a huge government-private partnership. You know, solar took off because there was massive government subsidies, right? Most most homeowners could not afford to pay 30 grand to put a solar installation on the roof if it didn't come from subsidies, right? right. And I'm grateful for those subsidies because it allowed us to move faster, but geothermal is further behind that. There hasn't been as much lobbying. And so there's not as many lawmakers that understand the benefit. And so we're, we're kind of pushing against that, you know, that rock uphill. Um, but you also mentioned something else, the Burbank power and water. I don't know if that's a corporation. It's a not for profit organization, right? And it's owned by its citizens, right. and managed by city council. So that's how right. do you it's feel? Public utility. So the, the, public the utility. citizens own the utility. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for clarifying. How do you feel like an organization, like a public utility, makes it easier for you to move, make decisions versus a corporation who's really driving for profit or shareholder interest? Yeah. Like how how do how do those work? Better, worse, together. You know. So just. Fundamentally, I'm opposed to private utility companies. And, and here's why for people listening in. Um, a public utility like Burbank Water and Power, the owners of the utility are the voters of the city. That's the way it's designed. For a private utility like PG&E, SoCal Gas, um, the owners of the utility are the shareholders. So these are private stockholders of shares in this private corporation. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes the will and needs of the voters is not exactly the same as the will and the needs of the shareholders. I'll give you an example. In the city of Burbank this last year, we were hit with um, inflation rates. Everybody was hit with inflation rates and uh, natural gas spikes uh, due to uh, supply chain issues, due to conflicts around the world. So for us to maintain a solid credit rating, to you know, take out loans, to um, update our 75-year-old infrastructure, right? It costs money, but also we need to be able to uh, turn to the um, creditors and say, well, we're a solvent uh, power generation company. We have rate payers who pay into the program. For us to raise rates, it takes a simple majority of the elected officials in the city. And we knew that if we didn't raise the rates, we would have problems with our credit rating and it would cost us more money in the end to update our infrastructure and get us onto a path uh, for greener tech. So for the voters, yes, it's going to cost more for them to pay those rates, but they save more money on the end because they're moving towards greener technology. If we were a private utility, we were a private utility and we wanted to update our outdated infrastructure, it wouldn't matter to the shareholders if we were going green. It wouldn't matter to the shareholders if our credit rating would drop in the future. The shareholders would only look at the quarterly earnings at the end of that three month profit cycle and they would make the determination of whether or not they wanted to pay more. Now, they probably wouldn't have voted for it because they wanted to save that money and get a nice dividend 
at the end of the, the quarter. So knowing that sometimes the needs of the people are different than the needs of a corporation, uh, I have always been in favor of a publicly owned utility. And we're actually much more nimble and we can adapt quicker simply through a vote of the majority of the uh, municipal government um, rather than having to go to the shareholders and talk to the board and convince the CEO. You know, all of that stuff is it drags on and drags on. And honestly, that's a lot of the reason why many of the public utilities across the country are still so far behind and why they still use fossil fuels because it's profitable. Yeah. And so just as a society, when we talk about power generation and climate change and fossil fuels, should we be in a mentality of which is the most profitable or should we be in a mentality of, oh my gosh, we're ruining the planet and we're all going to die. So like, <laughs> it's yeah. a little bit different. Yeah. And, and and I can understand both sides. And I thank you for sharing the distinction between both and the pros and cons. And I, and I understand that a corporation has a, a has a, a responsibility to its shareholders. But to your point, when a corporation might not even live in that state or, you know, uh, they're providing power to different states and they're, you know, it, it, it doesn't, it's not always best interests at heart. And I under, you know, the, of the, the users in the local area. So I totally understand that. And, and maybe last question, but something that I found interesting in the state of California, the first time I drove through certain parts of LA, I was kind of shocked to see oil derricks, right? oil being pumped and it was kind of counterintuitive to what I pictured of California. Um, or you look off, off, off the coast in certain areas and you see oil platforms. Right. And I know that's very controversial uh, depending on where you're at or, or, you know, your personal beliefs, political beliefs. Um, but one of the things that's going to take a little bit of education mayor for people to understand geothermal, it really stands on the backs of the oil industry. So as I mentioned, you've got to be able to drill four to six miles deep. Well, the first three to four miles, you have to use traditional oil and gas technology because it's so advanced, right? They've spent a century building it. They've spent lots of money perfecting it. And so to an average citizen, if they were to look in their backyard and see a drill rig, they're going to have some maybe negative connotations that you're drilling for oil. It, it looks the same. It's the exact same system and process. At a certain point, the rock gets too hard, and that's where the oil industry stopped because it no longer was economically feasible to keep drilling and spending money hitting hard rock so they move, right? But the education process is to help people understand that it's going to look like oil and gas. There's going to be some, you know, there's negativity around fracking um, in, the, in the geothermal industry. There's also a purpose of fracking, and what has to happen is you have to cause cracks in the rock in order to to release the trapped steam right and the more fractures you can get in an area the more potential to capture the steam so where historically people looked at fracking very negatively if you apply that towards a clean renewable opportunity there needs to be education to understand why is fracking different what the what are the benefits the the pros the cons um, but that's something I know I face with every day is trying to help people understand like, yeah, that looks like an oil drilling rig, but we're actually trying to tap clean, renewable, always on, um, you know, energy. So I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but. It, oh, you know, no. I mean, from my understanding, the, the major difference there is um, for natural gas, for fracking, for oil drilling, they're very limited in where they can go. They have to find those oil, you know, basins and, and, and gas pockets first, and then drill wherever that is. And that could be in residential neighborhoods near schools. A lot of these oil drills in Southern California are in residential neighborhoods, right? There's, there's a huge controversy right now. Uh, there's even one in South LA here. That's like within throwing distance of a school. And, you know, the rig has been there for decades. And so when we look at what hydro, um, oh, sorry, what uh, uh, geothermal needs, um, there is so many more places and varied places that you can build. You can go out to the desert, right? You can go out to where there's no people and build and 
you have more opportunities in places that are less um, impactful uh, versus what oil and gas has been doing for, you know, like you said, over a century where they hunt and hunt and hunt and there's only one space that they can do it irregardless of what else is in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so for my money, you know, having the options to do the drilling um, and, you know, it is, it's disruptive, right? It does affect the area around it. Um, not to the extent that a giant solar field right. <laughs> or yeah. a lithium mine would yeah. do, right? Yep. But uh, we need to be cautious that it is impactful. It does um, uh, disrupt uh, the environment. We can find the places that it works yeah. because we have more options with that. Very, uh, very true. Well, I, I've been appreciative on how excited you are about alternative energy sources. Obviously, you have a, a reason to with the state mandate, but just your personal interest and in you trying to help your, you know, your constituents and the people that live in your local area. Um, to your point, even with a natural gas burning power plant, most people don't realize where it comes from. They just want it to be reliable and they want it to be affordable. And, you know, education is going to be the key. And that's, you know, there's a lot of work that has to happen there. But Thanks for being willing to share with us, you know, kind of it, for the city of Burbank, what you guys are doing. You know, I guess my uh, one last question is like, how do other cities in California and the country model what they're doing after Burbank? You know, you have a lot of initiatives and like you said, oftentimes they're sporadic. They don't work as a master plan, but um, is Burbank a shining city on a hill in more ways than one where other people can emulate what you're doing? Uh, yeah. So I, I tell people all the time, um, we have kind of an outsized voice at Burbank water and power. We go to conferences, you know, statewide, uh, uh, nationwide conferences, and we send a rep from Burbank water and power. And more often than not, when our person walks in the door, everyone goes, oh, Burbank is here. Oh, what are they talking about? What's going on? We are on that cutting edge. We are, uh, like I said, we have this grant for uh, uh, iron flow battery that most people aren't getting. We are purchasing uh, power in places that are generating new green tech. You know, we want to move um, forward on more of our supply coming from there. But when we enter into, you know, multi-contract negotiations and there's other bigger cities like LA is huge. But when we walk in, they say, oh, listen to these guys. They're going to run the floor. They're going to talk about what we need. We'll back them up because we have a, a, a keen eye for this kind of thing. And I'll tell people, anyone watching, we have our own uh, uh, municipal uh, Twitter account for Burbank Water and Power separately. Burbank H2O Power. Uh, check it out. They talk about this stuff all the time. It's it's um, run by a, a, a separate um, um, public information officer that is only talking about the newest technology, the the, the newest innovations. Um, it has a, kind of an interesting following uh, out there on Twitter. And um, if you're into this kind of like, you know, if you're a, uh, water and power techie nerd uh, definitely uh, follow that account they they do good stuff well thank you well thanks for spending your time on our our podcast today i think it's important for people to understand what their elected officials are trying to do and and why it's important and like you said you know many people might not understand why the the officials have voted for a price increase right maybe they don't see the end goal of what you did and why you did it and that just comes with communication and education but you know, it sounds like you did that with the, their best interest at heart, even if they didn't see that, you know, all they saw was an increase to their bill. But um, I, I, again, I appreciate what you're doing. I'd love for our viewers to continue to watch what you and the city of Burbank are doing in terms of the those efforts to get carbon neutral. And, you know, we hope to continue to follow you and stay in touch down the road and see if there's a way we can, you know, all help geothermal come to market. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm on all the social media platforms as well. Constantine in California is my handle. Uh, you can check out my website as well, constantineanthony.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope the best for you. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.